morning. Beginning where we left off last night, Dogen says, the universe fills your whole body and mind. The Buddha said it this way, he said, the Dhamma, the Dhamma is apparent here and now. It's accessible. It can be experienced individually by those who will seek it out. So knowing this and saying this is a start, it's a pointer, it's a good direction. But as we would say in the Mahayana, it's like eating a painted rice cake. It doesn't exactly satisfy your hunger. That's why we have to make the effort to actually walk the path, to actually put the path into practice. Because nobody can do it for you. Even in the Buddha's time, when someone would ask the Buddha, please enlighten me, he said, I cannot do that for you. But it's my hope today to offer, and over the next couple of days, to offer some of those pointers, some things, some guidance that might encourage you along this way. But it's going to take some effort. It's going to take some effort, and the right kind of effort in particular, a skillful kind of effort. Because ultimately, your whole life is effort. The fact that you got out of bed, and you got yourself dressed, and you got yourself here, or in front of the computer, for those of you who are watching on Facebook, All of those things are effort. So effort can be applied in all kinds of ways, skillful ways and unskillful ways, neutral ways. But the point is that we have to make a choice. So you are going to live this life and you are going to experience each breath of this life in one way or another, asleep or awake. Recently I was at a, a katina, an alms gathering ceremony at Karuna Buddhist Vihara there in California. And I, uh, Satima, this um, lovely 80-something year old Sri Lankan nun, was giving the Dhamma talk, the Dhamma reflection that day. And she said, she said, okay, so life begins with birth, life ends with death. You start at point B, and you end at point D. Or at least this, this piece of it, if you will. And what's between B and D? C. C for choice. Chaitana in Pali. Volition or intention. So, there are some very traditional ways in which uh, right effort is described, the four great endeavors, as they're sometimes translated, and I'll talk more about those later. But for now, staying a little bit with the overview, I thought I might share a um, quote 
from Ajahn Chah. So Ajahn Chah was a very revered teacher in the Thai Theravada forest tradition, the one that I'm currently practicing in. And in Ajahn Chah, there's a book called uh, Still Forest Pool, which might be up here on the book shelf somewhere. If not, we'll have to donate you a copy. Mm -hmm. um, which is a compilation of short, pithy teachings that Ajahn Chah gave. I highly recommend it. Very useful, practical, day-to-day -day kinds of teachings. And profound. And even Ajahn Chah says this about effort. He says, proper effort is not the effort to make something particular happen. It is the effort to be aware and awake in each moment. The effort to overcome laziness and defilement. The effort to make each activity of our day meditation. So what I like about this quote is that I see him pointing indirectly at some of the ways in which we misapply our effort. So beginning with the effort to make something particular happen. So I think that you will find, both in your life and in your practice, which are not two separate things, I hope, that when you drive forward from a fixed view of self, then you will invariably meet more suffering. That's what he means by the effort to make a particular thing happen. Whether it's on the cushion, trying to force a particular mind state or grasp at a particular attainment, or whether it's in your relationships, or the way you treat your body. So there's some aspect, there's some aspect of gentleness that has to come in. There's some aspect of uh, intimacy that helps to inform our way, this way. And then he says, the effort to be aware and awake in each moment. Mm -hmm. So properly speaking, awareness is always present. In a sense, awareness is the state of the universe. Conditions responding to each other according to the principles of impermanence, karma, emptiness, non-self. And, and dukkha, sort of fundamental unsatisfactoriness. But the awake part, that's our work. And one particular tool that you might have heard of that will help you with that practice is sati, is the Pali word for it, and mindfulness, typically translated as mindfulness. So in Zen, we're always talking about this kind of indirectly, always pointing at the present moment and the complete uh, integration of the absolute reality and the mundane reality. But in practical terms, 
mindfulness, it has a, it has the um, the meaning of memory, remembering, and it's kind of an attentiveness or a watchfulness, a bare attention. In Spanish, we translate it that way: atención plena. Meaning a kind of attentiveness that sets down the judgments and, as we said, grief toward the world. And so this brings us closer to the points of contact, the points of interaction of this body and mind with all things which is a place where we can begin to see how those functions actually work. So mindfulness will bring us into intimacy with our life. Very directly. A good example of this was a uh, young woman that I was working with a number of years back, I was co-leading a year-long program, non-residential program, at San Francisco Zen Center. And we had a big cohort, so we had divided up among the, the leaders, the co-leaders. And one of the women that was in uh, my group was this young woman, she's married, she has a three-year-old daughter very capable, very responsible, kind of office job, you know, with it, somebody who's with it. And at the beginning of the program, we had given everyone a task. The first, the first exercise was to go home and notice which foot you put in your shorts or your pants or your skirt or your sarong or your kilt or whatever you're wearing today which foot you put in first. Pretty straightforward, very simple practice of mindfulness of body. Okay? Grounding ourselves in awareness of the body. So two months into this, this young woman comes to me and says, in a private interview, two months have gone by, I still have not figured out which foot I put into my skirt first. I can't believe it. Every day I get in my car to get to, to go to work and I think, oh my gosh, I missed it again. <laughs> again. <laughs> and so we had a little talk about that, about attentiveness, about bringing awareness before the moment that you're trying to be aware of, <laughs> about intention, about slowing down a little bit, about habit energy, how does that carry us forward in a way that's not so aware, so mindful. So a few weeks went by and she came back in another interview and she said, all right, I got it. I saw which foot I put in my skirt first. I said, great, which foot do you put in first? She said, I put in my left foot, but that's not the coolest part. The coolest part is that my daughter also puts her left foot in first. Sweet. Right? So she came into a new way of knowing herself, and she also came into a, a new intimacy with her daughter, this little being that she lives with every day. This thing that she had been missing all along. Not huge, but a small way in which there can be a little bit more harmony, a little bit more presence, a little bit more understanding. So maybe that could be your assignment tomorrow morning. You could figure out which foot you put into your skirt or your pants or your shorts or your 
leggings. First, or not, <laughs> but I offer that as a, as a way to show that even, even what seems like a very mundane effort, what seems like a very small thing in your life can be very important. It can show you things that you can't even imagine right now. She didn't know that about her daughter. And she didn't know that she would learn that by watching her foot. So there's this incredible possibility, this incredible opportunity, moment by moment. for it, things to open up in ways that you can't imagine. It's not mysticism. It's just saying the path unfolds step by step. And if we're clear about it, it's not the path to direct knowing so much as it is a path of direct knowing. The direct knowing is there. But are we going to be able to touch into that? Are we going to be able to align our intention, our attention, with that fundamental awareness? Get out of our own way and see how those two things are aligned. So going back to Ajahn Chah, he says, the effort to overcome laziness and defilement. Oh boy. <laughs> so the Buddha said over and over again, and every Zen master you've ever heard said over and over and over again, persevere, be wholehearted in your effort. Really give it your all. Again, being careful, being careful that this does not become a hero-making endeavor. Okay. That's not the point. That's not the point. In fact, I would suggest that the folks who have gone further in the practice are very evident by their humility. Because when you really begin to see how things are, how, th how really truly interdependent things are, then it's easy to be grateful it's easy to be appreciative of all that it takes for even one being to have one moment of mindfulness. There's a sutta in which the Buddha gives this, this uh, he says, Practicing mindfulness for the amount, the length of time that it takes to pull the udder of a cow, you will remember this one, I hope, that it takes the length of time it takes to pull the udder of a cow is more beneficial than an entire lifetime of giving thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of things. It's not to say that you shouldn't be giving is to say that the actual activity of practice is the most important focus for you to have. Can you say that again one more time? Because it, because what the Buddha said? That the connection 
season of giving. In oh, mindless yes, that's right. We're in the season of giving good. Yes, that, that, so the Buddha said, actually practicing mindfulness for the p- length of time that it takes to pull the udder of a cow. So like maybe like a second. <laughs> <laughs> is more beneficial than an entire lifetime of giving thousands and thousands and thousands of things. Lots of elephants and gold coins and things that were what he referred to at that time. Which is not to say that we shouldn't be giving, that we shouldn't be generous. I would say giving, generosity, is one of the first steps on the path. It's a way that we begin to understand that we are not less by giving more, by being a positive effect in the world. But it is to say that mere giving is not sufficient. That the greatest gift we give the world is to find wisdom and compassion within ourselves and to be that. That's the greatest gift we give the world. And people encounter this oftentimes, I think, when they are practicing and they get resistance from their friends or from their family. Mm -hmm. When you're practicing and people don't understand why you're putting in the time or giving the gifts or being away. (coughs) But then as they see how practice is transformative, then they can understand what it means. They can understand at some level that they too are receiving that gift. So defilement usually understood as the hindrances in terms of meditation practice. I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. But then again, to finish up the phrase here, the effort to make each activity of our day meditation. It's a high bar. It's a high bar. I know that from my own experience make each activity of our daily meditation. Yes? The name of the sutta? Uh, you said that this book is from Ajahn Chah. Oh, the book from Ajahn Chah. It's uh, Still Forest Pool. Still Forest Pool. Ajahn, A-J-A-H-N, Cha, C-H-A-H. Um, make each activity of our daily meditation. So I would suggest that this is asking for curiosity. (coughs) It's asking us to bring a sense of curiosity and investigation (coughs) and exploration to our lives. We can't be open to a new experience, which is certainly what practice will bring, a new experience. We can't be open to a new experience unless there's some sense of curiosity. What is it? What's happening now? That's another one of the descriptors that the Buddha gave encouraging investigation, the nature of the Dhamma. So Dhamma or Dharma, this word, if you look in the dictionary, the Pali Dictionary, you probably find about 25 or 26 different translations for it. It can mean law, like natural law, or it can mean reality, truth, And it means, oftentimes, the teachings that are pointing to that reality or to those truths. That's the way we usually hear about it. And 
each one of us, going back to that original statement, when you understand yourself as an expression of the way that things really are, because you couldn't possibly be anything else, you are fully integrated into reality. When you understand that in that way, then you know that you yourself are Dhamma. So bringing this attitude of curiosity, this attitude of discovery, this investigation, we can open to different experiences in our day. We have a bit of time still, so I'm going to tell you a story about a fish. One of my favorite stories to tell. So I was at uh, Tassajara. It's a Zen monastery, uh, a couple of hours inland from Carmel, California, in what's called the Ventana Wilderness. And it was New Year's Day, and in California, New Year's Day, still walking, walking weather. It was nice and sunny and crisp. So I went out for a walk to the creek. Tassajara is named after the, the creek, Tassajara Creek. It runs right through the middle of it. I went out for a walk to the bend in the creek where at that time of the year the water would be low and you could cross over to the other side if I wanted to get my shoes wet. So I walked out to the bend in the creek and I stood there for a second And as I was standing there, this little fish, about that big, hopped up out of the water, hop, 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 right on the rocks next to my foot. Beautiful little fish, pink with little circles on, on its belly. Hopped up on the rocks, and I, I stood there looking at the fish for a few minutes before realizing that the fish wasn't going to be able to get off of the rock fish was stuck right there, next to my foot. So once I figured that out, I thought, well, okay, I have to help the fish get in the water. So I tried to pick it up, and no, 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 no. It was not having any of that. <laughs> no, no, no. It squirmed, and it moved, and it's slippery, and, you know, and I tried several times to pick up the fish. But you know, and like you can't squeeze hard because then you'll harm it, and then what's the point of putting it back in the water when you're gonna harm it? So it wasn't working. So I stopped for a moment and I thought about it. I thought, what something's not working here. And then I realized, oh yeah, fish need water. The fish probably, if I just give it some water, then it'll be able to do its thing. It'll be able to get back in the creek by itself. So I scooped up some some fish and some water, whoosh, all in one, scooped it up, whoosh, and the fish went back into the creek. Yay! <laughs> A happy moment. Happy moment all around. And so there are many teachings to that story, and that's why I've told it many times. But one, one teaching in particular that I want to point to here is the aspect of harmony. That even this being who has, presumably, more intelligence, more resources, more strength, more understanding of the situation than that fish, even I cannot help unless I'm in harmony with this being. And the fish also cannot do things a fish's way without being in harmony with me helping. It's not going to be the fish's way, and it's not going to be my way. It's going to be together. 
and doing it that way together, then it worked out. But I went, and this goes back to the, the aspect of discovery, I went from knowing that fish need water to really knowing that fish need water. It wasn't a concept anymore. <coughs> and I'd been somebody who'd had all kinds of fish tanks and, you know, I'd had fish before. I knew that I learned that fish need water, you know, probably as a toddler, for goodness sake. And yet, in that moment, there was a deep shift. There was a deep experiential knowing of this. It wasn't some idea. It was like, oh yes, the fish lives in water. It only knows water. So there's a difference between our idea of the thing and our actual lived experience of the thing. And interestingly, it was a matter of life or death for the fish. It was a matter of life or death. The Buddha has taught that death, awareness of death, can be, can lead to a kind of spiritual urgency why? Because it helps us. It helps us to know how precious this moment really is. It makes very clear to us what's at stake here. So I hope that you'll take this opportunity this weekend to really bring that mind of curiosity. To really set down whatever ideas you have about how this body and mind are is, in this moment, find out. Let it tell you. Bring your attention in line with your awareness. Going back to the story about the young woman with her foot, she was aware, right? She was able to get her clothes on. <coughs> but her mindfulness was gone. Her attentiveness to that activity was gone. So you've put yourself in this situation here where you have the opportunity to do nothing but that for a little while. And rest assured that no matter what's going on in your mind, and no matter what's going on in your body, you can be present with it. That's one of the great gifts of meditation. That we learn that we can sit still and face no matter what comes up. It doesn't mean that we don't need to respond. Sometimes we do. But we begin by turning and facing it. <clears throat> as clearly, as clearly as we possibly can. And you could say, in a way, that we are hardwired, we're built that way. 
One of the frameworks that the Buddha gave, also gave, for understanding a human life is the five khandhas. He gave uh, this way of understanding a human being as the body, the form element, the material element, and four aspects of mind. And he said, that when these, these bodies come into contact with the objects around us, which is happening all the time, that creates a moment of that kind of consciousness. So when you hear the plane, when the sound of the plane meets your ear, then there is a contact and a moment of ear consciousness. And what that means is that you are literally, both physically and mentally, connected to that thing, that phenomenon. So stay tuned into that. There's a part of you that knows how to do this. There's a part of you that's, that's already perfectly comfortable doing this practice. I think that you'll find that this is a very supportive place in which to do that. That this is a safe space in which to do that. Lots of things will come up in your practice if you keep at it. And we have the tools and the compassion to meet that together. That's what I want to share with you this morning. So let's sit quietly for a few minutes.